Well, I'm gonna, uh, again, everyone, Pacific greetings and uh, a warm welcome from Suva office um, on behalf of Pacific Network on Globalization and the Pacific Blue Line, we welcome you all to this webinar series. Um, this will be the, the second part of the series called Just Transition um, and what it means for ocean steps. Um, and you have, if you have missed out on the first one, we will surely um, share the link to the recording in the chat. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, and just a brief on the webinar format for this afternoon. Uh, we will be having a 40 to 45 minute uh, presentation and then we will open it up um, to everyone. So if you have any questions or would like to see clarity, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, but as I've mentioned, we will be opening it up for Q&A um, after the presentation. We welcome your comments, feedback and contributions. So we will go straight into it. Um, as many of you may already know, Jason is a PhD student from the University of Melbourne and is a research intern um, with Peng at the moment. His research looks at the narratives and framings of climate change in the Pacific through a post-colonial lens. Um, he is examining dominant uh, narratives on the issue of climate change in the Pacific and how Pacific act activists and activist networks respond to this. Um, he is particularly interested in learning about the specific narratives that the Pacific artists, activists, um, activist networks, and organizations uh, want to put out and communicate. So in this webinar, Jason will be diving deeper into the discussions of just transition, um, just green transition uh, rather, and the narratives used by corporations and governments uh, promoting climate solutions that will uh, pretty much make um, things worse for the Pacific. So without further delay, I now pass it on to Jason. Jinaka Jason. Thank you very much for that, Lisa, and thank you very much. Um, welcome and thank you so much for maintaining interest in this webinar series. I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, so thank you so much again, everyone, and I will quickly uh, get straight into it. In terms of um, the webinar, in terms of the format, I will take you through a very brief recap of the first webinar and some key takeaways as this linked directly to the, today's webinar. But generally what today's webinar will focus on is various arguments that are put forth by proponents or supporters of uh, and promoters of deep seabed mining and how the language that they use tends to appropriate the language and the goals of the just transition. Um, and after looking at all that, I will then look at specific concerns relating to some of the arguments that they are putting forward. Um, so if any of you have more specific questions with regard or, or may have missed the first webinar and towards the end of the webinar, this webinar would like some clarification, uh, please feel free to drop them, drop those into the question, uh, into the chat box and in the Q&A box and we will get to that after the webinar presentation um so thank you very much everyone and i'll get straight into it so in terms of the first webinar some of the key takeaways is that yes there's this conversation about the just transition and moving to renewable energies and so on but these technologies need uh need a lot of metal so what this has resulted in is different regions and countries and so on framing and defining certain minerals as being critical and strategic and what this has meant is that with this just transition, you now have this promotion, this use of the language to promote this new scramble for resources, whereby, yes, there's this conversation about the just trend, green transition to address climate change, but it's resulting in this scramble for resources, which would and could lead to more extractivism and commodification of minerals and so on. And the thing is, the minerals are needed in this just transition or for the renewable energy technologies are rather specific. And these minerals and metals are very geographically concentrated in terms of where they're located and where they're processed. So as a result, geopolitics has come into it. And as a result, you have this gap where people are uh, people are saying, well, we need these metals and these minerals and so on, and they're trying to put forth alternatives to getting these metals that are not terrestrial mining. 
And this is where the arguments by DSM proponents come on. Uh, sorry, that was quite a rushed recap of the first webinar, but I believe uh, Lysa will be providing a link of the recording to the first webinar, and I am more than happy to answer uh, any specific questions that you have at this, the end of this webinar. Thank you. So straight into it. Firstly, um, I will take you over a quick overview of what exactly are the metals and deposits found on the seafloor and how they will be mined. And uh, because this does link to the debates and the arguments that are put forth by proponents of deep seabed mining. So there are three main types of metal deposits. The first is seafloor massive or polymetallic sulfide deposits. They're called polymetallic, meaning these deposits have multiple forms or multiple types of minerals and metals and so on. So yes, found at depths of 1,000 to 4,000 meters below sea level, and it's found in areas with active tectonic activity. They are quite rich in copper, lead, zinc, gold, silver. In terms of how these would be mined, this would be actually um, reports show that this would be similar to open pit terrestrial mining, where they'd have to crush the ores on the seafloor and then pump this to the top to a collecting vessel. So you have these risks of sediment plumes uh, from the actual mining of the of the deposits, as well as the discharge of sedimented water with, when it gets to the surface. The, and these are just some images of what these deposits look like. The next is cobalt rich crusts. Um, as the name suggests, they are particularly rich in cobalt. So these are formed on sediment free rock surfaces uh, at the ocean depths, at various depths, really. They are rich in cobalt, as the name suggests, but they also have nickel, copper, tellurium, and other metals present, as well as rare earths. And these deposits or crusts form layers that can be up to 26 centimeters thick. The way that they would be mined is quite similar to how the polymetallic uh, sulfide deposits would be mined. So crushed and then pumped up, so you have the risk of sediment plumes and so on. And this is just an image of what they look like. The third one, and this is what I will spend a lot of time on and which a lot of the presentation will focus on, is polymetallic manganese nodules, what proponents of deep seabed mining are particularly interested in. So these are found at depths of from four to 6,500 meters. They contain cobalt, copper, nickel, rare earths, and other metals. The way that they would be mined, they could either be extracted whole from the seabed or crushed into a slurry and then pumped up to the surface. Also, these nodules are distributed over a wide area, so that means that you would need to mine large areas of land. And this is what the deposits look like. Now, the reason as to why many proponents of deep seabed mining are particularly interested in this type of, in these deposits, the polymetallic manganese nodules is, with the other two, the ways they, by which they would be mined is, you know, you'd have to crush them, uh, crush the ore on the seafloor, you have the sediment issues and so on. With these nodules, what they're arguing, and I will get into more detail on that later in the presentation, is that they're simply nodules that you can pick up and thus you have minimal environmental impact compared to the other two. So this is why we partic particularly focus on these deposits. Um, in terms of the Pacific Islands region, what are the sort of deposits that we have? And this was extracted by a report from SPC. Um, basically, we have you've got a diversity with some countries having multiple forms of deposits and others having mainly one particular type. I won't dwell too much on this, but these are generally the types of deposits found in the Pacific. The green shading indicates that these deposits are present in those various select Pacific Island countries. Now, in looking at this, I will in look at this, I will spend some particular time focusing on the Clarion Clipperton zone or the CCZ, because this is where a lot of the interest in terms of mining for these minerals are on the high seas uh, outside of international borders uh, takes place. So it's this region that's that spread over 5,000 kilometers across the Pacific Ocean. And it is outside national jurisdiction. And because of this, it is governed by the International Seabed Authority, which operates under the tenets of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And this is significant, and I do get into that later in the presentation. And it is extremely rich in various deposits and particularly polymetallic nodules. And what's happening now is in this zone, you have multiple corporations or co contractors being granted exploration contracts. And um, it covers a massive area. And I'll get into that in the next few slides. So um, this is just a quick over 
view of a global map and the various types of deposits where they are dominantly found, as well as highlighting where the clarion clipperton zone is. It is this particular area. And in terms of a clarion clipperton zone, this is just a quick excerpt on an extract of the different areas uh, that have been where, where contractors have been granted exploration licenses. So these are some of the exploration activities happening in the clarion clipperton zone right, uh, right now. Right. Now, so sorry that if that was rushed, but that was just a very quick overview of deep, uh, deep sea mining in terms of the various types of deposits, uh, the particular deposits of interest, as well as where these minerals and deposits are located. I next go into the arguments that are put forth by deep seabed mining proponents. So the key arguments that what their arguments often center about is the fact that this just transition means a shift to a greener economy, meaning more renewables. So you need lots of metal. And they're arguing the best way to get these metals is from the seafloor. So I use the example of those polymetallic nodules and they're polymetallic, meaning they have multiple types of metal. So the arguments that they're making, and this is a quote of, by Gerard Barron, who is the CEO of the metals company, that yeah, it's pretty much a battery in, the, in a rock. You get these metals, you can make these renewable energy technologies and so on. And those are the main arguments they're putting forth. So some of the arguments they make is that when you carry out terrestrial mining, so if we are to get all these metals through terrestrial mining, you will affect ecosystem services. So the arguments that they are making is that terrestrial mining will result in the land having to be stripped bare in order to get to the minerals. So this will result in trees being cut down. This affects habitats. These, so these affect provisioning services, regulating services, supporting services, even cultural services. So you strip it bare, you affect carbon sequestration of the trees uh, that are on this land, and you've got all the other harmful impacts associated with terrestrial mining, such as such as po issues of pollution, such as issues of air, of air pollution, water pollution, and so on. And they even uh, and they also use the argument in the reports put in, that they put out that terrestrial mining would also result in, in the in, um, disempowerment sorry of indigenous peoples as of land will be excluded it will not be uh, accessible to the peoples uh, the traditional custodians of the land and so on so they've put together this argument that if we do deep sea bed mining it's going to have much less impact on all these services provisioning services regulating services supporting services and cultural services the point they're making is they're simply going to extract or pluck these nodules and it will cause less harm uh, as opposed to terrestrial mining. And they argue that, you know, between terrestrial mining and deep sea mining, there's a disproportionate impact on megafauna and biomass. So they say um, the megafauna, which is um, on the, which on the seafloor is defined as those organisms of two to four centimeters in size. So they're saying that the population at risk from nodule collect, uh, collection is lesser or much lower compared to what would happen if we carried out the mining on land. And this is a quote by Gerard Barron as well, saying that, yeah, if you measure life as biomass, the average biomass per square meter is th 13 grams, referring to the uh, deep seabed. And they're saying, yeah, it's basically a, a lesser impact than terrestrial mining. And so he's quoted as saying, 17% of that is bacteria living in the sediment, which we won't destroy, but we'll give it a bit of a tumble as we pass over it. So the comparison they're making is that deep seabed mining will affect, will have a lesser impact on life forms as opposed to terrestrial mining. They take this argument further by putting forth a scenario on what would happen if we were to produce 1 billion EV, uh, referring to electronic vehicle batteries. So they argue that with terrestrial mining, it would result in 47 trillion megafauna placed at risk, and you know, all these 568 megatons of biomass impacted. And they argue that deep seabed mining would have a lesser impact, as you can see, compared to terrestrial mining. Whereas well, Gerard Barron said, um, and that's just taken from the earlier quote, that's all we're going to do, actually. We're going to create a little bit of dust. So the framing and argument that they're using here is that the deep seabed um, is almost like an abyssal or deep sea desert in terms of the amount of life that's present. That's an argument that they're making to try to justify that DSM would have a lesser impact than terrestrial mining. They take it further in terms of biodiversity. So they argue, um, they, know, they make the argument that 
the top 17 mega diverse countries in the world, and they classify mega diversity based on countries that have at least 5,000 endemic species and which also um, border onto marine ecosystems. They say that the top 17 mega diverse countries all have the presence of mining and that these top 17 countries are home to about 70% of the Earth's species. So they're using this argument to say, well, therefore, if we need to get all these metals for the just transition to terrestrial mining, what does that mean for biodiversity? So this is a quick excerpt from the report I'm citing. Um, I should note that this report that I'm citing was commissioned by uh, Deep Green, which is now known as the Metals Company. It was funded by them. Um, so that's the argument they're making, that these are the top 17 biodiverse countries, and they have all have the presence of mining or these minerals, which they argue are critical um, for the just transition and so on. They also use the argument of supply chains. Um, so for those of you who are present in the first webinar, I did touch a lot on this and the issue of these minerals and supply chains. Uh, just as a quick recap, these are some of the same uh, graphs that I showed, and these are taken from the International Energy A uh, Agency, where as you can see, all these minerals are quite geographically concentrated in terms of their location. And apart from the geographic concentration of the minerals, the processing of these minerals is quite geographically concentrated as well, with much of the processing, as you can see, taking place in China. So the argument that they're making is that with deep seabed mining, you could actually have more resilient and robust supply chains where you don't have to rely on just a few sources for the minerals. You can, uh, it becomes easier because they argue, um, Gerard Barron uses the example of the United States and argues that it's a 50,000 mile supply chain. So he argues that this can be turned into 1,500 mile supply chain by collecting these rocks and shipping them directly. So here the argument they're making is you can make supply chains more resilient because you don't have to rely on these few countries. And this also has the implications that by collecting these rocks, uh, or these nodules, or mining these nodules rather, things such as the carbon footprint of the minerals and metals can be reduced because the supply chains are shortened. So these are some of the arguments that they're also putting forth. So the idea is, yes, you mine the nodules and then they argue you can directly transport them to any deep water port. And then at this port, you can make use of the existing infrastructure. You can just build the processing facilities there and then use the existing infrastructure to send it out. So an additional part of that argument that they're making is that by just because of the nature of DSM and you just need to send it to a deep water port, these ports have existing infrastructure. So we won't have to necessarily, you know, clear new land to build more infrastructure and so on, thus reducing the carbon footprint of the metals, uh, of the metals produced. So those are some of the arguments as well that have been put forth. And there's also the argument that they make that deep seabed mining activities on the high seas, um, such as in the clarion Clipperton zone that I mentioned, is governed by the International Seabed Authority, which operates under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and that UNCLOS has anti-monopolistic provisions. So they argue this is a good way to ensure that there's healthy competition and so on, to avoid specific entities from having a monopoly over these minerals. And they use the argument of the circular economy as well. So the World Bank put out a report that uh, in 2020, that even if we achieve 100% end of life recycling, that there would still be a demand for minerals. And this is a direct quote, especially the case for those minerals with the highest growth in demand, which lack existing material to recycle and reuse. The proponents of DSM have jumped onto this argument. And Gerard Barron, the CEO of the metals company, is quoted as saying, Sorry. The ultimate adaptation, of course, is to stop these operations as soon as we've filled up the inventory. The argument that they're making is it's simply just with deep sea bed mining, it's not supposed to be an ongoing thing. It's about getting just enough metals to ensure we can have enough to recycle and have this circular economy. He's further quoted uh, as saying, uh, making the argument that you just dig up enough metals to make what you can't currently make out of the current metal pool. And he's arguing that this can become a metal commons. So this idea of metals as this common good that is not that is not simply mined and dumped and so on, but this concept of renting and returned. Um, and one of the arguments put forth is this notion that people would not own batteries. Uh, for those of us who are from Fiji, 
we'd be familiar with the example of the Fiji gas cylinder model, where you don't own the gas cylinder, you use it until it's finished, you return it and pay for an, pay for another one, but it's constantly exchanged. That's the argument they're trying to make that with these batteries, you don't own it. You use it once it's done and you take it back for recycling before you get a new one. So they have quite, they have actually used this language of the circular economy and this this notion of you know recycling and sustainability to try and promote and put forth their arguments. They also argue that deep seabed mining would ensure deep seabed mining as a system could actually ensure that the revenues from deep seabed mining could be equitably distributed um you know amongst various states and so on so a key argument that's being made is that there would be significant financial benefits that could be broadly distributed to various countries so the argument is that yeah if deep seabed mining takes place on the high seas so for example in the claren clipperton zone which comes under Un the isa and unclos under UNCLOS, the areas are, and its resources are considered the common heritage of all mankind. So the idea is that these resources are to be for the common heritage of mankind. And so the International Seabed Authority is the one who administers the deep seabed mining activities. And there is a provision that ISA shall collect and equitably share certain royalties or revenues amongst the ISA members. So the argument that they're making is that these revenues can then be shared. So Gerard Barron makes the argument that, you know, their concessions, um, the exploratory activities are sponsored by developing countries that are reliant on things such as foreign aid, um, fishing licenses, and so on for revenue. And the argument they're making is that, you know, these countries and societies are the least contributors to climate change and face disproportionate impacts. So the argument, in, in a crux, the point they're making is, the revenues through deep sea bed mining can be equitably distributed. And so while it's addressing the climate crisis, these revenues can also help develop countries who are suffering from the impact of climate change and so on. And this could be used for you, development and all that. So they use this argument in two tiers. So in a way, it's quite a seductive argument that, oh, if we allow deep sea bed mining, we can actually address the climate change crisis and at the same time get revenues that can assist with development. So anyway, sorry if that was a bit rushed um, and I'm happy to answer any questions for clarification at the end of the presentation. That's a very, I've tried to be as detailed as possible, but there are a lot more arguments that they're making, but in the interest of time and clarity and so on, I really had to condense and summarize. But those are some of the key arguments that are being made by proponents of deep sea bed mining. They're basically arguing that with deep sea bed mining, you'll have more efficient supply chains, you will have a lesser impact on biodiversity and so on, and you won't affect carbon sequestration, like if you're to clear forests on land and all that. And that at the same time, the revenues from this can be for the common good of humanity and so on, in terms of how the ISA would distribute revenues and so on. So those are some of the key arguments that they are making. However, there are key concerns around a lot of these arguments. So firstly, this argu the arguments that they make relating to carbon footprint, these arguments where they say, you know, with terrestrial mining, you clear the forests, um, sequestered carbon is released and so on, while with DSM, it has a lesser impact. Gerard Barron is quoted as saying, um, I'll actually read, it, read the whole thing out. The idea of protecting the oceans is a really easy thing to get behind. That's what we are doing. We are developing this business to protect the oceans because the biggest risks to our oceans is global warming and acidification. So they're making the argument that deep seabed mining is really an activity that is to protect and save the oceans and the environment and so on. But the reality is that with deep seabed, seabed mining, it could affect marine sediments. And these are some of the biggest and most critical carbon reservoirs in our planet. So if these are disturbed and that sequestered carbon is released, well, the science is still not fully settled on how DSM can disturb and impact the sequestration. So when they argue that DSM could have a lower carbon footprint and so on, as opposed to terrestrial mining, there are, it still raises a lot of questions because much more research needs to be done. Additionally, there was a report from Planet Track, and they argue that in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of these come from the actual processing of it. So they argue that 
the processing of uh, minerals that you get from terrestrial mining and minerals that you get from deep seabed mining, well, they would basically have similar emission, sort of similar emissions because a lot of the emissions come from the process. Apart from that, the argument that they make where they argue that there is lesser biodiversity on the deep seabed, and there, it has even been framed as being some sort of abyssal desert and so on, and that terrestrial mining would have this bigger impact on biodiversity and that deep seabed mining is less harmful, that argument is rather problematic for several reasons. Firstly, a lot of the data that we have on the areas uh, on the deep seabed, well, these data sets are problematic. So in 2019, the International Seabed Authority launched a data set called Deep Data. And researchers looking at this data set found that it had really, it had inherent problems. So the first thing they highlighted was that the key providers of data to this data set were the contractors undertaking mineral exploration on the deep seabed. The second is the data itself had a lot of quality issues. So I'll quickly unpack these. Firstly, the data fields, and I apologize if I'm getting too technical, but they found that it needed cleaning and harmonizing to ensure that it was standardized. And they found that 90% of the data had either missing or incomplete information for multiple fields and some things they picked up. Uh, the data on their sampling methods, how they did their sampling, which is really important for analysis, only 44% of the records had this sort of data. Another important thing is data on size class. This is quite important uh, when you're looking at organisms on the deep seabed because size is an important metric when you classify them. And yet data on size class, it's often missing. So there were these issues as well. And then they noted a lot of the data is yet to be published. So the authors downloaded the data set on the 12th of July, 2021. And they noted that this was data from only 24 cruisers and 10 contractors. Yet, according to the ISA secretary, they noted that there had been over 100 deep seabed exploration cruisers. So the data set is incomplete. And this is also significant for other reasons, which I'll get to in the next few slides. And there was also issues with data duplication. So this raises the question, like I'm coming back to this quote by Gerard Barron about the measuring of life as biomass and so on. When this argument is made, what data are they basing it on and what is the quality of the data? So all the arguments put forth by DSM proponents, particularly on biodiversity and what sort of life we have on the seabed, how accurate is the data that is informing that? And this is also significant for another reason. Um, the abyssal plains, the deep seabed, it's not a desert. So the same authors who looked at the data issues um, in the ISA data set, they published a further paper. They synthesized the records and after cleaning it up and so on, they still found that they still found over 5,000 metazoan species. Uh, sorry for the technical language. So metazoa, it's one of those major classifications in the animal kingdom, which encompasses all animals, uh, apart from single cell microscopic animals and sponges. So metazoa are basically multi-celled animals that have bodies differentiated into tissues and organs. So like animals with tissues, organs like us, the human species, for instance. So they found more than 5,000 of these species, of which 5,142 were a named species. So they're basically saying 92% of the species identified in the CCZ after cleaning up the data, after those issues and the fact that it's incomplete, was new to science. So again, this comes back. When the argument is made that, you know, the abyssal plains are desert, it's just a matter of picking, picking up rocks and we're not really harming much biodiversity. What is the quality of the data informing these arguments? Apart from that, proponents of deep seabed mining have argued that, you know, you can have conservation mechanisms. You can have areas that are reserved where you won't have activities that can be protected. And to this end, proposals and plans have been put in place to try and conserve the biodiversity and so on. But these, pro these conservation plans and so on are also problematic. 
So the International Seabed Authority in the Claren Clipperton Zone has designated all these areas of particular environmental interest, environmental interest. These are to be protected areas where you know where you're just supposed to protect and conserve them. So you know, um think similar to the concept of marine protected areas in the Pacific and so on. Sounds great. However, the sort of habitats and species that you have on the deep seabed, it's not homogenous. It's not the same type of habitat or species all across the seabed. Research has found that these APEIs may not actually represent the full range of habitats in the CCZ, especially those richest in nodules, meaning the existing APEIs won't be enough to cover the full range of the biodiversity and species and so habitats and all that. Apart from that, there have been multiple studies that have looked at various APEIs and found that the sort of biogeochemical features, the sort of life that you have in these areas are very different from other nearby areas. In other words, in one spot, you may have a certain type of habitat with certain types of species. In another nearby spot, it's different. So when you're talking, the idea with conservation is when you conserve an area, you want it to try and re be representative. But the proposed plans unfortunately, do not ensure that. So yeah, basically many species are not broadly distributed, meaning they're particularly found in very specific places. So that means like, it potentially means that even if you have more protected areas, there will be species left out. And you add to this the fact that we still don't know a lot. I mean, think back to the last few slides on the data sets and the number of new species discovered, and it's still not complete, mind you. Um, those are still not complete records. So we still don't know a lot about the species and habitats, yet, and yet this is already a problem. Apart from that, this argument about minimal harm, so you know the arguments put forth by DSM proponents, particularly with polymetallic manganese nodules, is it's about picking up rocks and so on. But the thing is, like over almost 30 years ago now, there was an there was a trial experiment in the Peru basin, and it was called DISCOL, Disturbance and Recolonization Experiment. So they conducted this in the Clarence Clipperton zone. What they did was on the seabed, they dragged a plow to try and simulate the impact that a deep sea, that a mining vehicle might have on the deep seabed. And that took place between 1989 and 1996. I provided a QR code. Um, this takes you to the DISCOL website, which has a lot of very interesting and fascinating findings and reports available for free on that website. Um, so you can scan the QR codes to get to the website. So anyway, that was conducted between 1989 to 1996. But then 26 years later, researchers revisited this spot to see whether the impact had stopped or whether they were ongoing. And what they found was that the effects of this simulated deep sea mining was still very much evident 26 years after the original DISCOL experiment. What they found was there was significant biological impact in the pre presumed reference area. So the reference area, excuse me, the reference area is an area that they kept aside to hope that the idea was that it wouldn't be affected by the simulated experiment. So it could sort of be like a control. What they argued was if the reference area still represents a true control, because when they came back, they couldn't be sure whether it was still a control or whether it had been impacted by the activities. So he's saying, if it is a true control, species in the area and those of adjacent areas have not yet recovered. However, if they restrict their assessment to the discal experimental area, so that's the DEA alone, so they don't take into account this reference area, then they argue that there is evidence of continuing impact. And the PT, sorry, PTs refers to the plow tracks from the simulated uh, activity and some evidence of continuing impact in the immediate vicinity. Um, to simply, simply means if they restrict the area, the assessment to the DEA alone, the impact is continuing. If they also factor in the reference area, then that means the areas have not yet recovered. But either way, it still means that 26 years later, it's either the areas have not yet recovered, so the impacts have happened and they're still recovering and haven't recovered yet, or the impacts are still very much ongoing. So this is something to think of 26 years later. What does this mean for the narrative and argument put forth by proponents of deep seabed mining that 
you're just collecting rocks on the seafloor. Apart from that, the, a big part of deep seabed mining and a big part of what they're using to promote is that, you know, you're getting these metals to save the environment, they're saying, and these equitable economic benefits can be broadly shared. But this is questionable. So the ISA produced this technical report, which looks at this notion of equitable benefit sharing. And I apologize in advance, as this will get a bit technical here. Um, so there's this projection of, you know, the ISA receiving revenues from these mines over a period of medium, long, and very long-term period. So it's, in, as I get into this, it doesn't look at annual income or revenues. It's looking at medium, long, and very long-term periods. So the thing is, researchers have looked at the formula and uh, the details in the ISA technical report, they argue, well, firstly, when the ISA receives the revenue, that money is not immediately distributed. So the contractors, they pay the ISA, then you have the deduction for administrative costs, then uh, you could have things such as deduction to compensate land-based mining countries for potential lost revenue, uh, potential deduction for enterprise costs. Um, my apologies, I should have covered this earlier. Enterprise refers to the arm of the International Seabed Authority, which can carry out deep seabed mining. So another thing to consider is the ISA is responsible for regulating deep seabed mining and all that. They also, under the enterprise, could engage in it themselves. So you could have these possible deductions for that. Then the deductions to repay other states for previous contributions before you actually get to an amount that can be distributed. So what does this actually mean? So um. Researchers put up, put forth a scenario. So they assume they use the scenario where let's say you have two polymetallic nodule mines. So they try to develop scenarios on how the revenues from these mines would be distributed based on the ISA formula. They forecast based on this scenario that in the medium term, you would have available $14 million to be distributed in the long term, $113 million. And in the very long term, $228 million. I'll get into what that means in practice in the next slide. So there were two formulas used by the ISA in terms of it. And the researchers, as they were looking at this, found that like with the first formula, it tends to favor states with large populations and low capita incomes, and they would receive a very large share. So for instance, India. If you look at the examples from the Pacific, such as Kiribati and Niue, in, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, in the medium term, this is what like Kiribati and Niue would receive. In the long term, this is what they would receive. And this is the very long-term benefits as a percentage of gross national income. So that was the first formula. With the second formula, they tried to readjust it um, to wait out uh, uh, to be better and so on. And this is the second one. So it slightly improves, like let's say for the Pacific Island countries listed like Kiribati and Niue, but this is the projected very long-term benefits as a percentage of gross national income. So just keep in mind, this scenario is, is this, these projections and calculations are based on a scenario where the authors put forth that let's say you have two mines operating and the amount available after the ISA might deduct costs for its revenues, budget, economic assistance, and so on. So the thing is, as a percentage of GNI, the monetary benefits for mining on the high, if you're doing, going to do mining on the high seas for Pacific Island countries, it's not very significant. And at the same time, you need to consider the fact that the arguments made by DSM proponents with regards to sharing of revenues, they like to talk about equitability. Such a distribution could not, is not equitable really. So that is problematic in itself. With these arguments that deep seabed mining would create all these revenues, that royalties would be paid to the ISA and so on, and it could be distributed, what would it actually mean in practice? Well, it raises much more questions than answers. And apart from that, we have a lot of, there are alternatives, and new increasing alternatives to deep seabed mining and critical minerals. So, you know, there's this framing, uh, which I covered in the first webinar, that you need these very specific types of minerals to create high quality batteries and so on that can store a lot of energy. So you need these specific minerals. 
but alternatives are being put forth. And the thing is with green technologies, the development is, it's going very fast, new innovation are constantly coming up. And different types of technologies, they have different types of metal requirements. And that apart from the fact that technologies are being developed and it's happening at a fast pace, you already have existing battery technologies that would have a lower critical mineral requirement. And apart from that, efforts are already undergoing to try and recycle and reuse the existing minerals. And corporations themselves are looking at these alternatives. So the first one is batteries that are often jokingly referred to as rust and fertilizer batteries because their main components are iron and phosphate. These were previously not really favored because they weren't as energy dense. They would be a bit bulky, uh, quite bulky, and people were more interested in smaller, more smaller batteries that could store more energy. But technological improvements have meant that these batteries are becoming very viable alternatives. It does the job basically. And in fact, with Tesla, Elon Musk has been quoted as saying that going forth, a lot of the heavy lifting for electrification, they'll be using these sort of batteries. So for electric vehicles and all that. And firms are exploring this as an alternative to lithium. Um, if you remember from, for those who attended the first webinar, sorry, lithium is one of those minerals that is being framed as this really critical mineral. Corporations are looking at a lot of other alternatives. So the question is, do we actually need all these minerals or critical minerals as they frame that are on the seafloor? Or is this yet another rush for resources, another race for resources? So these are questions that need to be considered. Uh, thank you very much. And oh, wow, I almost kept to time. Um, thank you. So sorry if that seemed rushed, but in a nutshell, so the arguments put forth by proponents of deep seabed mining is that you have less a bio you have less biodiversity on the deep seabed. So therefore, it's better to get the metals for this just transition from there. Because if you do terrestrial mining, it's, it can cause extinction of species, or it will clear forest and release sequestered carbon. Um, it's, it can affect indigenous populations and so on and so forth. And there's a lot. And therefore, they're saying deep seabed mining is like the way to go. And the arguments they've put forth are clever, they're seductive, and you know, they use the aims of the just transition. The just transition aims that as we move towards this green economy, no one is left behind, you don't cause harm, um, and that benefits are equitably distributed. So they are using that sort of language to frame their arguments that, you know, deep seabed mining will cause lesser harm to the environment and humanity, the revenues from it will be equitably distributed, and so on. But the reality is, firstly, the abyssal plains are not deserts. Already they are constantly finding new species, and this is from records that are, well, as I pointed out earlier, that are incomplete and which had inherent problems, yet they still found numerous new species. The simple point being, we still know very little about the species on the deep seabed. And so the arguments that they're making that DSM has lesser harm on the environment, at best they're premature, and at worst, you could argue they're very highly disingenuous. And with deep seabed mining and the narratives around it to promote it using the just transition, it really is another commodified solution because when you look at the issue of like, when you look at the system of capitalism, often as issues pop up, the solutions proposed seem to focus more on extracting something else and being more efficient in how you extract it. But the focus is still very much on extracting something and something does not come from nothing. That is something you must keep in mind. And getting that something causes impact. And DS, deep seabed mining is really another commodified solution. It's yet another one. But what they have done is they have appropriated and used social justice language to promote and frame their arguments in a, in a very clever and seductive way. So yeah, the points that I've made, it's yet another iteration of you know extracting as being the way to address solutions but the arguments they make are much more polished now. And the question is, when we look at these issues, who actually stands to benefit from it? The narrative is that humanity benefits um, in terms of this just green transition and in terms of revenues and all that, but current data shows that there are inherent problems in, this, uh, in these arguments. So is it really about a just transition or is it simply another 
economic race to grab resources. So those are some key takeaways from that. Um, and some basically a summary of the arguments put forth by supporters of deep sea bed mining and concerns around the arguments raised by them. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and time and we stand ready to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, everyone. Nakawakaleva Jason uh, for that great presentation um, and for taking us on a journey to the seafloor and um, learn more about these minerals, uh, but also the realities of these narratives around um, just green transition and how corporations and governments use these uh, framings to justify their race for these critical minerals. Um, we will jump on now to Q&A uh, comments uh, the floor is open. You can raise your hand or you can drop it in the chat box. Uh, we have Simon uh, Salopuka with his hand raised. Uh, Simon, would you like to um, ask your question? Yes, Simon, thank you. If you could unmute, um, we'll be able to hear it for your question, please. Thank you. Sorry, Simon, uh, you're still muted, so we can't hear you. If if, if you'd like, you can unmute and ask the question or drop it in the chat box if that's easiest for you. Simon, he's still there? Um, I guess very quickly, we'll just jump on to one of the questions on the on the chat. Uh, so this is um, from uh, Merita. What is the document and research source of the analysis of deep sea mining proposed economic benefits or who are the authors? Sure. Um, I'm actually typing that out in the chat box right now. Give me like one minute and I'll have it sent. Um, in the meantime, as I'm sending that, um, if anyone else has any other questions, please do send them through or raise your hand and ask them through audio, please. All right, thank you. Um, for those who were, for those who are asking about um the the details of the paper, I just sent through the the title of the paper as well as the authors and the DOI of the paper. All right. Um, we've got. Would you like? Sorry, Elise. Would you like to um ask your question? To what extent are Pacific countries wanting to move forward with deep sea mining, um, taking on board the arguments you have put forward? Uh, thank you very much for that. Yes, so um, in terms of the Pacific, it is there is division in terms of the various Pacific Island countries on their stance on deep sea bed mining. Some are going for a moratorium, other countries are actually in favor and trying to go forth um, with deep sea bed mining, for instance, uh, the metals company, which is undertaking expo exploration in the Claret Clipton zone, they have some. Uh, they have Pacific Island countries as their sponsoring states. 
So basically for a corporation to undertake exploration in that zone, they need to be sponsored by a state. So they are sponsored by some Pacific Island companies. We've also got a question from Vinata Jason. We also got a question from Vehia Awila. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, I can read it out as well. Um, very interesting presentation. How many countries in the Pacific are interested in deep sea mining already? Uh, there are a few now. So, for instance, Cook Islands is interested in deep sea bed mining. Nauru as well, and Nauru as well. Um, off the top of my head, those are two immediate examples. So, there are some countries currently who are interested in deep sea bed mining in the Pacific. And just another one as well. Just curious, is there any statement put forth from the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity? Um, my apologies. I don't cover that particular aspect um, in the research that I've done. It is something that I'll do at a later date. But right now, I'm sorry, I can't give you an answer because I haven't read and, for and tracked that yet. I'm really sorry about that. I think we have Simon on. Uh, Simon, would you like to ask your question? I guess he's still um, trying to unmute. Um, I've got another question here. If we keep uh, keep this rolling, we've got. Um, so my question is really um, in the rationale put forward by Cook Islands. For instance, to what extent um, are they talking? Are, are they taking on board what are you what are you saying? What are you are saying? On um, yes, thanks for that. Um, in that case, my apologies, but my work so far has been rather academic so i'm not engaged in those spaces so far like for instance at the advocacy workshops or at the regional meetings and so on um hopefully through pang um the research can be disseminated but i'm not actually in those spaces at the moment so my apologies i don't actually have an answer for that Dinaka for your questions um, is the support from the Pacific for deep sea mining? Um, deep sea mining uses the same false narrative of it's part of the just transition, or is it more economic uh, centric or geopolitical centric? The sense I get right now, um, and that's not something I've specifically focused on yet, which it's still part of the ongoing research, but the sense I get right now is that it's often quite economically centric right now. Uh, in terms of the geopolitics stuff that is off from what I've read and the research so far, those are the geopolitics arguments often come from like the US, the European Union and so on, in the way that they frame the minerals as being critical. So like now people talk about critical minerals but who actually defines what makes a mineral critical? So in the first webinar that was sort of unpacked with regards to who's, what are the definitions of critical minerals and how geopolitics has played a key role in the definitions of these critical minerals. So sorry, in a nutshell, the sense I get is the support from the Pacific often tends to focus more on the economic aspects, while the geopolitical aspect is more externally, where that's the concept, that's this massive concern about the geopolitics and the robustness of the supply chains of these markets. Um, we've got one here from, from Tena. Tena, would you like to ask your question? Okay, um, I can also read it out. 
Uh, any science relating to why we should not engage um, in DSM is not entertained, unfortunately, but we will continue. It's more like a comment, but we will com continue to push as an NGO against deep sea mining. That's a comment from uh, Tena, uh, also a partner in the Cook Islands. Tanaka Tena. Thank you so much, Tina. Like, uh, yeah, it's a comment, but yeah, I guess a thought is like with DSM, we still don't have a lot of facts or data because of how the nature of the deep seabed and how this, we still don't know a lot about it, but enough does exist to make some very significant and powerful arguments against deep seabed mining. But at the same time, I do wonder, um, is it, yeah, how do we tell a more powerful story in that sense? One that can grasp it because like, in doing this research, I personally like, yeah, I'm interested in it, but at times it got really dry and technical. So yeah, maybe it's something for all of us to think of in our collective networks. How do we take the dry technical stuff and put that into that scientifically sound, the data's factually sound, in, and so it's factually sound, but into a captivating story that can really capture attention. So sorry, yeah, uh, just wandering off the top of my head on that note, thank you. We've also got uh, one more question, Jason. Um, so thank you for, for your presentation. Great overview of the situation in the CCZ. Do you have any thoughts on how you think the political processes in the ISA uh, will proceed in the coming future? Right now, sorry, again, I do not have an answer because I haven't covered it yet and I focused the research thus far is focused more on the narratives put forth by DSM proponents and concerns around it. So, sorry, I don't have a direct answer for that just yet, as that's not specifically the focus of my research right now in terms of the, the internal mechanisms. It's It will come, but I'm not at that stage yet. My apologies. Thank you, Jason. I think this is another question um, from uh, Sindra Sharma. Would you like to um, ask your question directly? Sindra. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, that's, sorry, I just opened the chat. Uh, yeah, so thank you for that question, Sindra. Um, one of the other arguments, which you may have, um, is job creation in a just energy transition. However, I was curious how equitably those jobs may be distributed to local communities. Uh, yes, thanks for raising that. That is a key argument put forth by proponents of DSM. It's just that because of the limited time, I couldn't put everything in. Otherwise, I might have spent the whole webinar putting forth just the arguments made by the proponents of DSM. Because they, there's a lot. So, yes, that is one of the arguments they put forth. And there's this argument that you can use existing knowledge and knowledge and technology. And so, therefore, there's a lesser risk of people being left behind because, and this ties even more closely to the just transition because the just transition originated out of the labor unions and movements. The idea is that if you move to a new economic system, like if you go green, those in the fossil fuel industry are left behind. So, some arguments put forth is that. Well, we already mine these minerals and process them. So there are already people working who know how to do all these things. So they they can still have work and, you know, they won't be left out. It's just that what they're going to be processing is coming from the seafloor instead of terrestrial. So, yes, that is a key argument that is being raised as well. Thank you for that question. Sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. I think we will take one more question. Um, and this is the data quality section of your presentation was really alarming to hear, to hear, sorry. How can our policymakers make effective evidence-based decision, make decision making when the data is flawed? Yeah, it's a challenging one because, like, for instance, I personally am not a statistician and so on. So I had to rely on research by these other scholars and I sent the detail. Uh, I, I'm more than happy to email out these papers and so on if people reach out. So we have to rely on our scholars looking through the data we need specialists. But yes, it's 
the arguments are being made, and I do wonder whether at times we're responding directly to the arguments, but because of, you know, movements are often stretched thin and all that, what is underpinning those arguments that they are making, like critical minerals, it's become part of the jargon, the media talk about critical minerals and so on and all that internationally. But what does that even mean? And then as you unpack deeper, you look at the geopolitics around it. And same thing with the data. The argument they're making is, oh yeah, there's less biodiversity, uh, there's less species. But then if you look at the data set, and thank goodness for the researchers who have done that, those issues then are able to come up. I saw this comment, sorry, I think that's a reply from Elise Tutena about um, the article, Jason referred to debunks that not just for Cook Islands, but for other countries in terms of economic benefits. Uh, just a caveat on that article, that the scenario is focused on two polymetallic uh, manganese model mines in the high seas. So if you do the mining in the high seas, that comes under ISA, where all that equitable those equitable distribution mechanisms and um, that those formulas on for revenue will come into play. If mining takes place within EEZ, that would imply like, you know, the laws of the country and so on. So there may there would be or may be difference to how revenues are distributed and so on. So I have yet to fully delve into that because I focused on the broader narratives that they're using on DSM and I focus on the CCZ because they try to use the CCZ as case studies. But we also need to keep in mind that there could be nuance between what happens if you mine in exclusive economic zones and what happens if you're mining on the high seas. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I think we also we have one more question from Rufino Varea. Um, Ruf Fina, would you like to ask your question live? Um, happy I guess to I'll, read it up. Um, yeah, I'll read it up. So as regional um, crop agencies, are regional and crop agencies doing enough in informing and guide, guiding PCs when it comes to DSM and the needs or concerns the region is pushing uh, for to address in global negotiations like the BBNJ um, and other international con conventions and frameworks? Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm not involved in the crop spaces. So unfortunately, I can't really directly answer that. But I can speak from like a research perspective, like when I was trying to get data and information and so on. I mean, often for a lot of specific issues, you could rely on the crop agencies, perhaps for technical reports and all that. But um, in this particular case with DSM, I was able to get more data using my own university, like library databases and so on, than I was able to get um, through what those other sources. So sorry, that doesn't really fully answer the question as I'm not in the spaces, but from a research perspective, I think I was able to get more information and data from external sources, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you everyone for all your messages and comments um, and contributions on the chat. Uh, uh, we are on one hour exactly on the dot if I'm correct. If we don't have any more questions, um, Jason, should we um, end our call here? Uh, but the recording will be made available and we should also be emailing um, a link to everyone on this call, um, but also should be available on Pang and Pacific Blue Line social media and um, YouTube. Thanks. And uh, on our final note, I, I saw a yep. few questions about article sources. So feel free to email and I'll be happy to send the sources as well, if you'd like. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your patience and bearing with the delay in the second webinar after the drama of the initial awesome. second webinar. Thank you thank so you much, everyone. everyone, for joining in. And
உனக்கு பக்கம் எவ்வளவு